I think we're about to start. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dan Givoli, who is uh, a Lawrence and Marie Feldman Chair in, in Engineering at the Department of Aerospace Engineering at Technion Israel. Dan got his PhD in Mechanical Engineering at Stanford in 1988 with Joe Keller. His research is in the area of computational mechanics, in particular uh, numerical methods for wave problems, finite element methods for solid mechanics, structures, acoustics, and heat transfer, and combined analytic numerical methods in continuum mechanics. Dan has published one book on the, um, on the mechanics of problems in unbounded media, and he has authored or, or co-authored over 100 publications, or peer-reviewed publications. Uh, Dan is also currently editor of the journals of wave motion and computational acoustics, and he is on the, on the editorial board of a number of other journals. So with that, then the floor is yours. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I didn't need that. So thanks very much, and, and thanks for the uh, invitation to come here. It's a, a great pleasure and honor to be in this uh, very unique uh, university and department. Um, so we'll wait for the screen to wake up. Will it wake up? You should just unplug it and replug it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, probably. Right. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the three subjects, the three themes that are uh, shown here inverse problems, and then focus to time reversal, and then focus further to damage identification using time reversal. Um, my talk will not be very mathematical. I took care to, to talk to a, a wide audience, and, uh, and so those who like equations will be disappointed, but that's the deal. Um, this is a joint work uh, with Professor Eli Torkel from Tel Aviv University. His student uh, is Chak Levy, and my student, Eyal Amit. So um, the first thing that I'll talk about in general terms <coughs> is the, the class of problems called inverse problems, and I um, uh, assume many of you know about this, but I'll, I'll, I'll give a, a short introduction. Then I'll talk about time reversal, and uh, time reversal as a method for solving some inverse problems. And I'll talk specifically about two inverse problems. One is identifying a source, and this is relatively easy to do with time reversal. So I'll talk about the basics of that. And then the second problem, which is more uh, complicated, is uh, to identify damage or flaw in a structure, um, and, and I'll talk about that too, showing some numerical experiments. And talk about future work, which, uh, which we're, um, part of it is ongoing. So what are inverse uh, problems? And i uh, particularly uh, interested in inverse wave problems, namely uh, problems that uh, have to do with wave propagation. So in order to understand what inverse problems are about, let's talk about forward problems, which are the standard uh, problems that we all know and love. And uh, in, the, in the context of continuum mechanics, a standard or a forward uh, wave problem would uh, be based on a model uh, in which we have a full description including the geometry, the geometry of the model, the uh, material properties, which are mathematically usually the coefficients of the partial differential equation, the loads, which are uh, the right-hand side of the inhomogeneous part of the equation, boundary conditions, and initial conditions. All these are well-defined and known in the forward problem. And what we're seeking is to find the wave field, namely displacement, stresses, pressures, velocity, what have you. Um, 
On the other hand, in inverse wave problems, some of these uh, uh, mo uh, model parameters are not known. So we are missing part of the, pro of, of, the, uh, of the description of the model. For example, we are missing part or all of the geometry. We are missing part or all of the material properties, the loads, the boundary conditions, the initial conditions. <coughs> Something is missing from the model description. In order to compensate for this missing uh, data, we, uh, we have some measurements of the solution of the wave field at some point in space and or time. And these uh, measurements may be noisy. And then our goal is to complete the missing information from the model. So you see it's, it's actually the, the, the opposite of the, uh, of the standard problem. That's why it's called uh, an inverse problem. Um, now I'll give a few examples for inver inverse wave problems that are of interest to large communities. The first example is what is called or often called the obstacle problem. So in the obstacle problem you're given the general geometry, uh, material properties, and you're given an, an incident wave field and the measured reflected wave field. And what we're, you're looking for is the geometry of an obstacle or a scatter that is, is uh, somewhere in the domain, but you don't know where it is, you don't know what, what shape it has, and so on. Um, a particular example is that of identifying submarines. And this was, by the way, uh, a very hot uh, subject uh, during the 80s, 1980s. Although, if, if, you, if you did some research on that, you were not allowed to say submarine. You called it a, a cigar-shaped object. Uh, another type of problem is uh, that of geophysical imaging. Also, in the jargon of uh, geophysics, it's called migration. And this is uh, uh, where you're given uh, uh, the general geometry a rough model of the material properties uh, of the medium, wave sources, and measured signals at sensor locations. And what you're looking for is an image of the undersurface structure of the Earth, including things like interfaces b between uh, layers of material, faults, voids, uh, and so on. And this is a, a very a very heavy computation. It is, is, it is uh, usually based on time reversal, which I'll talk about later. And uh, the, the usually they need uh, supercomputers for that. Um, another very important class of problem is that of uh, medical imaging. There are many ver various types of methods for medical imaging based on waves. Uh, you know, ultrasound is something very, very uh, common, but there are also various uh, 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 versions of, of this uh, uh, with, with various levels of sophistication. Here, uh, actually what you're seeking is to map the material properties and in particular things like distinguish between hard tissues and soft tissues uh, and uh, among other people, uh, Boyan has done a lot of work in, uh, this, uh, uh, on this subject, uh, not just uh, during these years, but uh, most recently using uh, topological sensitivity as a tool for, for imaging. Um, another example is that of identifying sources, and this I'll, I'll talk about in more detail in a, in a minute using time reversal as a tool. Uh, here, actually, everything is given except the source, location, and intensity, and sometimes the dis distribution. So one obvious example is that of locating the epicenter of an earthquake. There is also uh, here an example of Lanbo Liu on um, locating acoustic sources in a city. A very nice uh, movie if, if, if you go to his uh, webmail. 
using time reversal. Uh, NDT, uh, non-destructive testing, is another application of or uh, occurrence of inverse wave problems. Here, uh, it's actually, you can think of it as a, as a special case of the obstacle problem because you want to, uh, to identify a scatterer, but whereas when we say the obstacle problem, we, we mainly think about unbounded domain with a, with a scatter inside. And here we are uh, typically talking about a finite domain, a finite structure where you have a flaw, a crack, or what, what have you, and you want to identify it by, uh, by wave methods that are non-destructive. In the aerospace industry, of course, this is a, a very common uh, thing that we want to do. The last example that I'll give is that of identifying uh, parameters of a dynamical system and let's look at the eigenvalue problem uh, shown here that that emerges from the dynamical system here in the in this dynamical sister uh, system the the mass uh, matrix was normalized so so you get uh, 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 just two matrices that characterize the system the the damping matrix and the stiffness matrix and this is the associated eigenvalue problem. Now the standard problem is given the matrices C and K to find the spectrum of the system, uh, while the inverse eigenvalue problems is, is given the spectrum uh, up to a certain uh, number of eigenvalues and eigenmodes, find the matrices C and K. This is uh, what mathema ma mathematicians call to hear the shape of a drum, and it's a, it's a very uh, difficult problem. So, um, oh, let me, let me add that uh, inverse, inverse problems uh, in general is, is a very hot subject that has been uh, attracting a lot of attention for years now, and in every single year you can find three or four uh, conferences on this, on inverse problems alone, there are journals dedicated to it, and you can also see that inverse problems people are, have, a, a, have a good sense of humor. Um, inverse problems are notorious for being very difficult, much more difficult than standard or forward problems. Why is that? First of all, they're almost always strongly nonlinear. Second, they're almost always ill-posed. What does it mean that they are ill-posed? Well, let's talk about what is well-posedness. A problem is called well-posed if it has all these three characteristics. It has an, a, a, an existence solution. It has a solution. The solution is unique. And the solution is stable, uh, which means that a small change in the data gives rise to a small change in the solution. Now, inverse wave problems can can have uh, a, a difficulty in either of, of these uh, categories and sometimes even in all of them. Uh, uh, first of all, the, the solution doesn't have to exist. If, for example, the data is noisy, someone, sometimes you will not find a solution that fits the, the data that you measure. Uh, sometimes you will get uh, many, many solutions, many possible solutions, especially if you don't have enough data, uh, not enough measurements. And uh, almost always uh, the uh, solutions are not stable, so a small change in the data will give rise to a large change in the solution. There are various ways to, to handle these difficulties. One is uh, to regularize regular the, uh, the, the problem, which means to uh, change actually the problem in some sense so that it becomes much more well posed. Uh, and then you can solve it and find the solution which is existent and so on and stable. The problem is of course that you change the ori original problem so you're, you're not solving the actual problem that you want to solve. And, and good regularization is one that uh, that does not change the problem a lot, yet gives you a well-posed a well uh, problem. So 
uh, with that, I will uh, come to uh, talk about time reversal. And time reversal actually started not as a computational method at all. It started as a physical process. It was started by, by uh, the physicist Fink, Matthias Fink, who is a French guy. Um, and uh, and as, uh, as I said, it, it started as a physical process. And uh, it is uh, employed as a physical process in various fields, uh, among other things in, in biomedical imaging. They're doing, and not just imaging, but uh, medicine. Uh, and they're doing some fascinating things with, with time reversal on the physical level. Uh, and, the, and the basic principle of time reversal is that for a reversible medium, uh, the wave propagation phenomenon is reversible. Uh, so if, if a medium is non-dissipative, you get reversibility in time, which means that you can run forward in time, you can predict the future, but you can also predict the past in the same manner. So that if you know the conditions today, you can run backwards in time and find out the, the, the history of the evolution of the wave propagation. Of course, uh, this is a major assumption that the medium is non-dissipative. Now, in recent years, uh, it has been realized that time reversal can also be used not just as a physical process, but as a computational tool to solve some uh, inverse problems. And <coughs> the most obvious uh, Application is to find a source. So I have a source that started to propagate at a certain time. I measure the, uh, the response at, time at some points in time and space. Then I have these measurements. I go backward in time, and my goal is to identify the source that started the, the whole thing. So this is the process that we do on the computer First of all, we have the physical process that uh, is going on and produces the measurements. Now, this physical process we can either do in the lab or we can emulate by a computer. What we, we have done so far is to emulate the physical process uh, by, by simulation. But it must be realized that this, what we call the forward run, is not something which is part of the method. It is just uh, there in order to synthesize the, the data that we, we should actually measure by experiments. And I'll show uh, at the end of the talk that we are now starting to do experiments in the lab. But so far we have done just uh, si simulations to emulate this uh, physical process. This brings us from time t equals zero to time equals big T. Then we have the measurements that we accumulated during this uh, time interval. And we go backward in time in a manner that I'll explain a bit later. And we go backward in time up to, again, time t equals zero. And our goal is to hopefully to identify the source that started the whole thing. So let me show you a movie that demonstrates this. So this is a cavity. Uh, it's it's uh, like a two-dimensional uh, cavity that, uh, that has uh, Neumann boundary condition or traction-free boundary condition. This is the time. Uh, you saw that we started from a source. And these are six sensors that keep track of the, of the measurements. They, uh, they measure. Uh, at every time step, they, they make a measurement and they, they store it. And we got to uh, the, the final time, 1,000. And then we, we go backwards in time. These six sensors now become the, uh, the actuators, and they radiate the waves backward in time. And you see what seems to be like a random... Uh, bunch of waves, but look what happens when we get to time uh, be, uh, back to time equals zero. We actually produce very nicely the original uh, source. 
And this is only from six points. We measure the response at six points, nowhere else. And thi this is enough to, um, to reproduce the source. Okay, so I will now give a list of some surprising facts on time reversal. Some of them I will demonstrate later. Some of them I will not have time to, to demonstrate. But, but these are things that really uh, every person who, who looks at time reversal is surprised by them. So first of all, we have seen that with relatively little information, time reversal can give excellent identification. And, and this, this process where you uh, start from a local source, then go backward in time and, and identify the local source, it's called refocusing. The waves are refocused at the original source. So we, we can get um, a very good uh, refocusing from little information. And the information can either be from uh, measurements in space or in time. There is a trade-off here. So uh, I can either have a few, uh, a few sensors but measure uh, the, the response at many times, or I can have many sensors and measure the response for a short amount of time, even at one time, just the final time, may be enough if I have enough sens sensors. So somehow the information, the, the, the method doesn't care if, if, the, if the information comes from time or from space, it will know how to use it in order to get the, the good refocusing. We also saw that the time, ref time reversal refocusing happens suddenly. I mean, nothing, it was not a gradual process of building up the, the source. Out of uh, uh, what seemed like a random field, uh, suddenly at, ta at, at the right time, we have a refocusing. So somehow this information uh, uh, is hidden in, 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 the, in the wave pattern. There is coherent energy that is wa just waiting for the right, uh, uh, the right moment to, uh, super, to, to be self-superimposed su and, and create the, uh, the data. Now, something that, that is really counterintuitive uh, is that heterogeneity is good for time reversal. If, if the medium is homogeneous, Time reversal will be, will be more difficult and uh, identification of, of the source will be more difficult. If you have many heterogeneities, you, you get be much better uh, refocusing. And the reason is that heterogeneity means multiple scattering. And multiple scattering means more information because you have, from all the reflections and the scattering, you have waves coming from different directions with different paths, and you have richer information from which the time reversal picks up the coherent er energy. Uh, so uh, this is something that one has to get used to, but it's, it, it's perfectly true. Uh, from the same reason, geometric complexi complexity is also good for time reversal. So for example, if I in the problems in an unbounded domain are more difficult for, for source identification than problems in, in, in closed domains because in closed domains you have all these reflections from the walls and you will have all this rich pattern of waves whereas in, in unbounded domain the waves just leave the domain after, after a while and you have no more information. So the amount of information that you can really use is, lim is much more limited. Another very uh, good piece of news is the time reversal is extremely insensitive to noise. This has been um, recognized uh, by various authors in, in, in various contents, contexts, but, uh, but it's really sometimes uh, so prominent that it's hard to believe. We, we in our, some of our examples that I won't have time to show here, we, uh, 
we got good identification even with levels of 100% noise, which means that the noise, noise is as large as the signal itself. So at first sight, you know, we thought we something was wrong in our codes, but it's actually, uh, if you think about it, what happens is that the, the noise is random, and this is an issue that I'll maybe mention later, but the, the noise is random, so it doesn't build up to any coherent information, whereas the coherent information is, is not random and, and it's, it's uh, guaranteed to build up to, 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 s to show you the, the feature that you're looking for. And what is even more amazing is that sometimes noise is good for you. So, I'll, and I'll show an example where we get rid of multiple solutions by adding artificial noise. So you'll see that uh, later. Um, so uh, I'll talk a little bit about what, what, what stands behind the time reversal operation mathematically. So these are the uh, linear elasticity, elastodynamics equations. This is the forward problem. So this is actually an emulation of the, of the reality. Uh, so we have some boundary conditions and we have initial conditions, okay? And, we, and, and suppose that the initial conditions are what we call the source. So the initial conditions are localized in, in some uh, small domain. Now we look at the uh, transformation tau equals big T minus T. This is the time reversal transformation. So we go backward in time. Tau is the reverse time variable. And for tau, uh, we call the variable W, we get the same wave equation because the, the elastic wave equation is invariant to this transformation. We get the same boundary condition. And here we take as initial conditions the, uh, the solution of the forward problem at time uh, t equals big T uh, with a minus sign for the velocity because we want to go backward in time and this transformation gives us, for the time derivative, it gives us a minus sign. So what, what we've done here is to take the entire solution for every x, for every location at a single time, but we, we measure it everywhere. And we use it as an initial condition, and then we go, and this is the rever time reversal problem, and its solution, it's easy to see that its solution is just the time reversed solution of the original problem. And in particular, if we take t equals big T, we are supposed to reproduce exactly the uh, source that we started with. So indeed, this is not surprising. Uh, so if we start with, with this source, we have a crack, but for the time being, we are not, the crack is just uh, something that we're supposed to know. Uh, but this is the, the, the source. After time, big T, we get this picture. We take all of it as the initial condition. We go backward in time. And of course, we reproduced exactly the, uh, the sources we started with. This is, this is what is called ideal time reversal. We, but we never measure the response everywhere, right? And so the more practical problem is that we have a small measurement manifold, omega m. And only there we can measure the, uh, the response of the forward problem. So the inverse problem, the time reversal problem, is uh, one in which we start from this data, but we take all the other, everything else is unknown to us, so we just take it to be zero. We just don't have information, so we take it to be zero, which mathematically is written in this way. So the, this uh, data is uh, multiplied by the characteristic function uh, chi m, which corresponds to this domain. Uh, and then we get, uh, at time t equals big T, we get this, this signal, which is supposed to be an approximation for the true source. And indeed, we get, so you see, we go forward in time. We measure only on the, on the right boundary in this case. We go backward in time. 
And indeed, we, we managed to identify the true source. So this, this is what time reversal or simple time reversal is all about. And of course, the question is, how does it work? How can, how can such little information give us such a good uh, refocusing? So there has been quite a lot of mathematical work on, uh, on this question. Uh, especially by Papa Nicolau and, and, uh, and his group. Uh, and, uh, and what we want to suggest is another way of looking at it, which is especially good for uh, bounded domain problems, because what, what the other mathematical methods of analysis were uh, basically uh, for unbounded domains uh, with ra random media. So very particular case. Here what we do is we take both the forward problem and the backward problem and we extend uh, everything in terms of uh, normal modes. So we, we get, uh, after a lot of algebra, we get this expression for the reproduced sources. Uh, and you see a lot, of, a lot of coefficients here and functions. But the most important thing is this, this IMN. IMN is the inner product of the, of the uh, uh, eigenfunctions, phi m, phi n, uh, over the measurement domain omega n. Now, we know that these functions are orthogonal in omega. Omega is the entire domain. So if this was omega, we will get here the, the Kronecker delta. And what would happen is that uh, we can show that if this happens and IMN is the Kronecker delta, then we actually reproduce exactly the, the, the original uh, source. But with partial information, we don't have uh, integral over omega, we have integral over the measurement domain omega m. So this will not be Kronecker's delta, but still the approximately the same result holds because of a very interesting and not so well known theorem that says that for sufficiently high modes, the eigenfunctions are orthogonal in any subdomain. Okay, this is something that you know, and, and I'm uh, actually mathematicians uh, are aware of this theorem, but, but there is not, I'm not aware of a, of a good uh, proof, uh, a general proof for, for, this, uh, for this claim. But the thing is that if you have, uh, if you look at the high modes, then whatever subdomain you consider, the uh, the, 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 the eigenfunctions are going to be approximately orthogonal in this subdomain. And approximate orthogonality means that if you, if you write IMN as an infinite uh, matrix, then the diagonal entries are going to be uh, much, uh, uh, much uh, smaller than the, uh, the uh, uh, so, sorry, uh, much larger than the off-diagonal entries. This can, for example, be demonstrated in one dimension uh, where you, you take the inner product of two uh, functions like the wave functions like that where Km is the wave number. And you see that if m equals to a, a n, this uh, integral is uh, of order L, order 1, whereas if uh, n is different than m, then the, this integral gives you an order of one over the wave number kn, where, and, and for high for the high modes, this is a uh, this is a small uh, this is a, a, a small number. So the, this actually means uh, what happens is that the, the the low modes don't play a role here too much. They're kind of they give us more noise. But the high modes are going to be approximately orthogonal. That's why they're going to give us this refocusing information. <coughs> um, 
I don't want to go into too much detail about how we uh, take into account multiple time measurements. There are various ways to do that and we do it in our own way, which is we believe to be more efficient than or more, more efficient, more accurate than other ways that have been proposed. It's basically based on superposing data on the fly. So we start, uh, this is the forward run, then we go backwards in time. And in each uh, time where we have measurements, we just superpose the measurements onto the solution. And af after we finish this process, we, we get all the data that we need. And we can prove that this, this works well. Um, a question that is, uh, that is uh, asked is, how much information do we need in order to get good identification of the source? And, um, and by doing some calculation, we get, this, uh, we get this formula, very simple, that shows the, the refocus uh, refocused energy density is uh, uh, divided by the background energy density. We want this uh, ratio to be uh, to be large in order to get good refocusing, and uh, we get that this is equal to one plus a m, which is the area, the measurement area or measure of the measurement. Uh, N T is the number of uh, measurement times. And AI is the size of the source. N is the amount of noise, uh, relative uh, noise in percents. And uh, since we want this to be large, this, this gives us this requirement, which means that the amount of information that we need, which is measured by the area of the measurement domain times the number of measurement times, should be larger than, than this number. So, and, and this fits quite well to, to our numerical experiments. There is a, an issue with, uh, with the modeling, uh, with the modeling uh, noise. In order to simulate noise, we add random noise to the, to the measurements. And uh, I think it was Boyan that, that pointed out to me that white noise, which is what we use originally, is not, is not so satisfactory because in, if, if we add just white noise to the, uh, to the data, to all the measurements, we are not considering correlations between, between measurements that are close to each other in space or in time. Whereas in reality, there is such correlation. So in order to correct this, we have now introduced a, a, a colored noise or correlated noise uh, and this, no this uh, noise is correlated both in space and in time, and uh, we use some known model to do that. And uh, indeed, uh, it, it, uh, it slightly reduced uh, the, the quality of the result, but only slightly, not, not in a significant manner. Um, Okay, uh, in order to, I mean, in reality, we don't know where the source was. So we don't know if we are successful in uh, identifying the sources or not. That's why we need something like a score that will give us uh, some idea on how well we, or to estimate how well we have done in identifying the source when we don't know where the source is. So this this was uh, part of the of the, uh, work of the student is Chak Levy, who developed a very smart algorithm that, give, that gives a very robust score. I will not go into details. Uh, and we, we use uh, some standard uh, finite elements, sometimes finite different schemes, to, um, to solve the, uh, both the forward and the inverse problems. I'll show some examples for identifying sources. Um, so. This is, this is the source. This is some scatter, which we assume to be known. Um, this is traction-free, periodic boundary conditions, and Dirichlet just, uh, just uh, took, took them as uh, arbitrarily. Um, and we have, we have s different amount of uh, noise levels. Uh, we experiment with all this. I'll just show uh, 
one, one particular example. So this is the, the true source. This is the identified source, which you see a, a pretty good result. But what is more important is to show the graph of the score and the graph of the true error. In this case, we know where the, the source is, so we can actually compute the true error of identification. And we also have this score that gives us a, a level of confidence. The score is actually gives us, uh, tells us how confident should we uh, be with the solution that we get. This, uh, these uh, uh, functions are plotted as function of the level of noise. And what is nice is that you see this correlation between the score and the error. When the error is small, which means that the identification is good, the score is high, which means that our level of confidence is, is high. If the uh, error is bad, then the score is, is very uh, low, which proves that, at least for this uh, type of example, that the score is doing a very good job in, um, in uh, predicting if we have found the true solution or not. And look at, uh, look at, uh, at the level of noise where things go bad, 100% noise. Uh, the, the score is smart enough to identify two sources or, or more if there are any. So this is an example where these are the two uh, original sources, these are the two identified sources. The re this result is somewhat less good than the, the first one, but still the identification is pretty good. Okay, now I'm going to talk about the maybe more interesting problem of flow identification. And as I said, this is something that is very interesting, not just in the aerospace industry, which I, I'm close to, but also in, in, uh, in many other applications, uh, civil engineering and so on. And let me skip that. And uh, uh, the way we, we um, identify damage or, or flaws in structure is based on a minimization algorithm. It's, a, it's an optimization problem uh, where in each step of the optimization we use time reversal. So instead of reading what is written here, let me explain it by, by uh, these pictures. So suppose that we have a crack and we want to identify the crack. Um, we have a source here, and in this case, the source is known. We have put the source there, so we know where the source is, okay? So we let it propagate. Uh, again, this, is, this is emulates actually a physical process. We let the waves propagate up to a certain time, and we make our measurements. Then we have the measurements, and we have to find where the uh, uh, crack is. If we guess correctly where the crack is, Time reversal will, will give us good f refocusing uh, at, the at the original uh, location of the source. If we guessed wrong where the uh, crack is, we will not get the refocusing. So the idea is to uh, actually to pose this problem as an optimization problem. Uh, and the optimization problem is find the parameters of the damage that will give you the best refocusing at the known uh, source location. So uh, let me show you uh, a result uh, of, 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 this, uh, of this type. So uh, now we, have a, we, we want to identify uh, a crack. We don't add any noise. And um, okay, and uh, and this this parameter is a parameter that tells us where the crack is. It doesn't matter exactly what the definition is, but th these numbers actually tell us the location of the crack. Uh, and there are like 200 possibilities, okay, or more. Um, this is the score that we get, and you see that it's hard to see. I mean, this is a, actually a candidate to be the right location of the crack, but this is also a candidate, and who knows, maybe one of these is, is the correct one. So 
I, it cannot really tell us uh, which one is the, uh, 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 the correct solution because we have many candidates. Now we add noise. We had 70% noise and look, wha look what happens. All the, uh, the spurious uh, solutions disappeared and we have just one very prominent solution and this is the correct uh, location. So this is an example where adding artificially uh, noise is, is good for us, which is kind of very strange, but, but, but this, is, uh, this works in this framework. Uh, so let me show you another movie of uh, identifying a crack. So uh, this is the correct crack. This is the guest crack. So we, we change the location. I just want to, uh, I'll run it again in a minute. Uh, we want to, to show that when the guest crack coincides with the correct crack, you get good refocusing here, which is what we're looking for, whereas in other locations you don't get refocusing. And this will, if we do uh, the optimization in, a, in an efficient way, this will lead us to the correct location of the crack or the correct parameters. So let me show this again. So of course, um, you know, trying all the possibilities is very inefficient. And we started by doing that. A very, you know, brute force way of looking for the right crack. But, uh, but now we are working on developing smart uh, optimizer that will do it in much, uh, much more efficiently. I'll, I'll talk about this in a, a little bit. So actually, I'm not far away from the ending. I'll just mention that it's very beneficial to uh, use multiple sources and combine the information uh, that we get from multiple sources, and we have a way to do that. And sometimes this in itself can uh, distinguish between, between the spurious candidates and the true uh, solution. And let me then talk uh, for five minutes about or less about ongoing work. So one of the things is to, to do the search for the damage in uh, the damage parameters in a, in a clever way, an efficient way. And one of the ideas that we have is to combine time reversal with another type of algori uh, algorithm called arrival time. Uh, arrival time is, is a very simple imaging technique that, uh, that works, uh, that is uh, kind of robust. It is very popular, but the problem is that it is crude. It gives you a, a very crude image, uh, and, uh, and uh, sometimes it gives you a large, uh, you know, uh, a large uh, dark spot and, and you cannot really know uh, the details. So, but we think that by combining time reversal with, with arrival time, we can, we can actually uh, make time reversal much more efficient. I, I won't have time to go into details. Another thing is to use what is called a time reversal absorbing condition, track, which is a method uh, developed by Asus, Nataf, uh, Turkel, and Cray. Uh, but we, uh, we, um, but it is also uh, lacking uh, some optimization schemes. So we we are going to extend it and equip it with a, an efficient op optimization scheme, and and uh, make it work much more efficiently. And finally. We are doing some experimental work, so we want to we want the data to be experimental and not just uh, synthetic as we do so far, and uh, we are so we we have this setup uh, for a, for a plane stress um, um, 
uh, experiment that we are then simulating also and try to, to find first uh, sources that are uh, activated there and then uh, uh, some in a later stage we will try to identify damage. Uh, we use uh, optical equipment in order to, uh, to, sen uh, to, to do this uh, sensing. Um, and I think that with that I will uh, close. I will just keep this slide on. So thanks a lot for your attention. To Dan. Uh, thank you for your talk and your nice explanation. Uh, I had a question about the noise aspect um, because that's kind of counterintuitive. So, uh, in terms of what kind of noise you're adding and also what is the original magnitude of your signal? Like does the original amplitude of the signal have any impact on what you're measuring? Because you could have a really noisy signal that has almost all noise. In it. So. Yeah, um, so, so the thing is uh, this. First of all, the point with the, with the kind of noise, okay? Um, Suppose you are measuring at uh, suppose you are measuring at two two points in time that just uh, adjacent to each other. It doesn't and, and there is some noise in the first one. Is it doesn't make sense that the noise at the second one, which is very close, will be completely unrelated. So that was Boyan's I think comment a while ago, and he said you know it makes sense that there is some correlation between between these two noises and that's why we, we introduced so so actually the randomness of the noise if it's completely white and non-correlated makes the problem easier because it's very random whereas with correlated noise there is some something less random in this and, and it makes it harder um, now it's true that the I mean even without noise, you have a lot of noise because the noise comes from the lack of information. You see, we take zero data in places where we don't have data, and this in itself gives us a lot of noise. So it's true, adding, adding noise to the measurement is actually not doing much uh, except to add, to add some, some additional noise, but it's all noise. And now, the, the, because the, the problem is linear, it's not so important the absolute you know, value of the, of the amplitude. What is important is the, actually the noise to, to signal ratio. And what happens is that we are, we are in this, in our method, we are superimposing a lot of information. For example, in different times. We take all the information from all the times and we add them all together. Now, when we do that, the noise is not added up because the noise in ra is random. So if you take, uh, you know, 100 times random noise, you get the same amount of random noise. You don't uh, multiply it by, by, by 100. On the other hand, the coherent information, the true information, is multiplied by 100. So that's the trick. The trick is to have enough information so that you build up so all the random noise remains random, but the, uh, but, but, but the true information is built up in a systematic way and, give, and gives you the true feature. William, thank you for this <coughs> fascinating talk. But I would like to, to follow up on the first question. In your noise, you assume that noise uh, it's independent from the magnitude of the signal, so it kind of it's proportional. But in real measurements, the, the level uh, noise to signal or ratio changes when the decrease of magnitude of the signal. And mm -hmm. that's what we have all the problems with heterogeneity and uh, additional sources. Because we, when you have uh, more, like longer path and, and, and amplitude decreases, mm -hmm. and now noise gets the same order of magnitude even higher than the signal mm -hmm. itself, heterogeneity, at least in concrete, is your, mm -hmm. is your <coughs> enemy. I would like to 
yeah, get your okay, perspective from true. this. That, that may be. Very nice talk. Um, maybe it's a naive question. Uh, when you talk about this noise, it's autocorrelated, so you must have autocorrelation lens for the noise random field. What happened? Yeah. What happened is that autocorrelation lens is comparable to the crack lens you want to detect. Then the effect on that. Uh. So you see, um, okay, the. Actually, in, uh, uh, we, as you know, as you saw, we are not working in the frequency domain. So actually, our in our source, uh, we activate all the all the frequencies, right? We have uh, all the frequencies there. I mean, up to the discretization, of course. I mean, the amount of uh, amount of modes that you actually represent in your discretization. So we assume that we we, we can we can span the, the spectrum in such a way that all, all the information carrying modes are represented uh, uh, sufficiently well. If they're not su represented sufficiently well, then, then you will not be able to do the, the identification. Um, so I think in this sense, the, um, the length scale uh, introduced by the, by the noise parameters uh, I'm not sure, but it's, I, I mean, I, I haven't checked this, actually. But, but my feeling is that it will not uh, be problematic, even if it's on the scale of the, uh, of the, of the wavelength. Yes. Oh, I mean, of, of, the, of the crack, of the crack length. Yeah. I mean, you need, of course, you need the, the high modes. I mean, the shorter the crack is, you need the high modes, uh, the higher modes to, uh, to capture it. You won't be able to capture it with the low modes, but but actually, you know, time rev people that have done time reversal in the past have almost always worked with point-like defects. Point-like defects uh, uh, work better in in the standard method, and I think we were one of the first to actually introduce uh, finite size defects. Uh, so that's what I can say about that. Thank you.